Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 354. And this time I'm going to talk about this record from 1970, released on Asha Records by the Lloyd McNeil Quartet, and it's called Washington Suite. It's released on Asha, as I said, which was Lloyd McNeil's own self publishing vehicle. This particular issue is a reissue, a 2017 reissue on Soul Jazz Records out of the UK. It's a needle drop because apparently the original tapes for this and its preceding record, Asha, have been lost. And so there is a bit of multi generationalness uh, to the sound, but the music is so lovely that I think it deserves your attention in any event. The late jazz flautist Lloyd McNeil was not only a jazz musician, but a visual artist, a poet, an educator, an historian, an essayist. He was instrumental in creating the Jazz Studies program at Rutgers University, where he taught for three decades, and he was widely exhibited as a visual artist in several countries. The volume of his recorded output as a leader is actually relatively slim, but it's held in high regard. He was a thoughtful and erudite advocate for black music and black music history. He befriended Pablo Picasso as a young man and maintained that friendship, and he generally led what seems to be a very interesting life of no little genius. This is one of two albums he puts out with his own quartet in the late 60s. It's not easy to categorize. Most commonly, it's lumped in under the title Spiritual Jazz. It has elements of many styles and a dreaminess and an adjacency to free jazz, which was typical of a lot of music of this era. But the musicianship is on a higher plane than most. Lloyd McNeil Jr. was born in Washington, D.C. on April 12, 1935, one of four children in the family. He had, unsurprisingly, a musical youth. He was part of the D.C. Boys Drum and Bugle Corps, which I presume means he played the bugle or the drums or possibly both, and he took piano lessons into his early teens. However, he was as interested in the visual arts as he was in music, and in fact, over the course of his own life, he would present himself as an artist as often as he would as a musician. As a teenager, he wasn't able to achieve much notoriety in either field. Growing up, he went to Terrell Junior High and then to Dunbar High School in Washington, after graduating, he then enrolls at Howard University in the fall of 1953, but he doesn't get to stay long because he's drafted and he ends up in the Navy in the early part of 1954. In 1956, with his service done, he returns to Howard University to study zoology of all things, but his interest was much more squarely as it turned out on art and music and he drops out in 1957. Although he doesn't end up recording anything for another 12 years, he's performing quite frequently and his regular trio at the time included himself on flute, Richard Spencer on the bongos, and Rick Powell on congas and African drums. Rick Powell goes on to have a fairly substantial career as an arranger, and he also plays percussion on Donny Hathaway's great track, The Ghetto. McNeil pursues both art and music in the later 1950s, and his interest in art really crystallizes in 1958. He begins his art studies at Morehouse College, where he gets his BFA, and he then goes back to Howard to get his MFA, which he received in 1963. He's performing all the while. While he was at Morehouse, he regularly played percussion with an outfit called the Lloyd Terry Band. He also acted as a sideman for Nina Simone, which he came down to Atlanta. And on one occasion, he also played with Lionel Hampton. In 1962, he met the brilliant avant-garde woodwind player Eric Dolphy at the DC International Jazz Festival and ends up taking flute lessons from him. He also takes lessons in composition from the chamber jazz composer Hale Smith. And my sense is that these two connections were critical in McNeil's development because both Smith and Dolphy were big contributors to the so-called third stream movement in the early 1960s, the one which basically tries to fuse classical and jazz. And that really shows up again in McNeil's work and in particular on this record. And during all this time, when he's taking flute lessons from Eric Dolphy, his paintings are still attracting a lot of attention. And he's invited in 1963-64 to become the artist in residence at Dartmouth College, where he goes and does this, and he also teaches there. In 1964, he and a musical friend from Howard University, Andrew White, who goes on to be a bit of a jazz funk pioneer in the 70s, moved to Paris, and they lived there for a year. In Paris, McNeil studies printmaking. He also studies a French language, but he gets a chance to tour musically as well, and he has a bit of a duo act with a guitar player from Guatemala, a guy called Julio Arenas Menas. They tour through the south of France, they play Cannes, and who should be in the audience but Pablo Picasso and his wife, and they come talk to them after the show and form a friendship. And McNeil would end up spending a fair amount of time with the couple in the remaining years of Picasso's life. McNeil returns to the U.S. in 1965, and in the latter part of the 1960s, he supports himself teaching here and there university-level art while writing and lecturing on black music history. 
In particular, he spends a fair amount of time teaching at Howard, and he's also performing with jazz groups around town, forms his own quartet, and these beginning years of his academic career are also the beginning years of his recording career. In 1969, his quartet's debut, which is called Asha, here it is, uh, he also does the art on these as well, is released on his own label, also called Asha. And that same year, with his friend and bassist in his quartet, Marshall Hawkins, he puts out a duet record called The Tanner Suite. In 1970, he's offered a tenure track position at Rutgers University as a professor of Afro-American history, as a professor of drawing and painting, and as an instructor of flute performance. And this beginning of his serious academic career is kind of the end, or it certainly leads to a hiatus in his recordings as a leader. But just before all that basically kicks in, he puts out this record, The Washington Suite, arguably his finest ever release. In the 1960s, McNeil, who was no stranger to working across the arts, had regularly provided live accompaniment to dance performances on his flute. In 1969, he was approached by Doris Jones and Claire Haywood, who were the co-directors of the Capitol Ballet Company in Washington, D.C., to put together a performance-level piece which ends up becoming known as the Washington Suite. This record is interesting for a variety of reasons, but one of them is the blend of the classical and jazz styles, I mentioned that before when he was studying with, with Dolphy and Hale, and of the instrumentation. The musicians are organized into two different groups. There's a traditional jazz quartet with McNeil on flute, Marshall Hawkins on bass, Eric Gravatt on drums, and Gene Rush on the Fender Rhodes piano. And there's also a quintet, kind of a chamber jazz woodwind quintet, which features McNeil on flute, Kenneth Pasmanic on bassoon, William Huntington on clarinet, Oren Olson on French horn, and Andrew White, his friend from Paris, on oboe, and Andrew White also does the arrangements. The production and engineering are both handled by Kurt Wittig, whose other recording credits are pretty much all in chamber music. And it was recorded in Washington, D.C. on two different dates, which I suspect align with the times when the Woodwind Quintet and the Jazz Quartet could get together respectively. The first of those is on March 22, 1970 at the National Collection of Fine Arts, and the second is nine days later at Workshop Corcoran. Side one starts with Home Rule, and this is very much out of the same moment which produces Pharaoh Sanders and Alice Coltrane, and so much of that great Strata East catalog, for instance. There's definitely a groove to this one, and to me, the peak moment of this whole track is Gene Rush's wonderful, gritty electric piano. That's followed by just 71% more. The magic of this record is largely due to the contrast between McNeil's sort of ethereal, fluttery flute and the funky magic of that Fender Rhodes. And then finally on side one, we come to 2504 Cliffborn Place. I think the masterpiece of this record, it's got a righteous flute riff, which will really be an earworm. And this track has also been sampled quite a bit, most notably by King Brit on his amazing record, uh, King Brit Presents Silk 130, When the Funk Hits the Fan. And if you haven't heard that record, you really should. And on this, there's also a really clever tempo change, which yields a traditionally swinging midsection. Side 2 is essentially one long piece of music, although it's broken up into different tracks, I guess, and there's a triptych in there as well. The beginning piece is Fountain in the Circle, which is the woodwind quartet, the chamber music quartet, if you want. And it really is chamber music, no more, no less. Then there's something called the City Triptych, which has three different parts to it. I wasn't able on repeated listings to identify with any real certainty when certain parts ended and others began. There's a wonderful bass solo by Hawkins here. This middle part of this second side probably needed a bit of an edit, but music is still lovely. And then at the end of the side, there's a reprise of Fountain in the Circle, which was played earlier by the Woodwind Quartet, but is replayed this time by the Jazz Quartet. As noted, this is not necessarily the best pressing that exists of this record, but it is, however, probably the only one you're likely to be able to find, and that's also true of the other record, Asha, which I showed you. It's a fiercely independent record, not necessarily that commercial, but full of beautiful music, and you're able to get this sense of musical exploration just jumping off the grooves. If you're a fan of Alice Coltrane or a fan of Pharaoh Sanders, I would recommend this record highly. I mark it down a little bit for the sound quality of the pressing and for maybe a lack of editing on side two, but you'll have no regrets in picking this up. And for me, it's four to five stars.